Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Oh, I got a green light. I could do a song and dance routine instead. I mean, yeah. Then. <laughs> ah, that, that sounds a bit better. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Congratulations to our audiovisual tech team here. I was going to do a song and dance routine, but no. Okay. Uh, welcome. Happy New Year. You laugh. You, <laughs> I could sing Walsing Matilda. Okay. Happy New Year to you all. My name is Paul Delaney. I'm the second vice president of the Toronto Centre. Ralph will be with us uh, shortly, certainly by the end of the meeting. No question about that. Uh, but uh, as I say, welcome uh, on such a, a bit of an inclement evening, sort of a mix of water and ice and so on, but I'm glad you all made it out here. Uh, are there any new visitors to us tonight for the first time? Well, double congratulations. There are two types of meetings that we host. One that you're at is a speaker's evening whereby we have uh, somebody from local or the international community giving a talk on some aspect of astronomy and space science. We host those eight times during the course of the year. And then in between those events, for considerably more than eight, we have our recreational astronomy nights where you hear from the rank and file about their latest exploits uh, in the areas of astronomy. All of the meetings, however, are hosted here at the Ontario Science Centre, nominally starting at 7.30 in the evening. Uh, as I said, Ralph will be with us shortly. There will be a set of announcements afterwards, but uh, without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the year, uh, Randy Atwood. He actually doesn't really need any introduction. He's uh, you know, the executive director of the RESC. Uh, he has been its past president. He's been past president of the Toronto Centre, past president of the Mississauga Centre created the Mississauga Center, etc. So he is Mr. RASC, if I can use that term. But he's been interested in astronomy and space science, particularly the outreach aspects thereof, for oh, many, many decades. In fact, he says on his uh, resume here, back to 1980, my bet is it probably even precedes that. But we'll grab 1980. Uh, he is certainly heard on radio and television far and wide. In fact, he and I often have shared microphones or have followed each other. Uh, so when the public needs uh, some clarification on astronomy and space science, Randy is a person that he is turned to. He certainly has chased down a lot of shuttle launches. This was a statistic that I read and I thought, ah, oh, 12 space shuttle launches. Really? Oh, I didn't even see one. At any rate, he has obviously been around. and. Night, in fact, reflects his passion for the space program because he's going to be talking to us about uh, Voyager, there it is, at 40, 40 years ago. Without any further ado, Randy Atwood. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'd like to thank Andrew and, uh, sorry, I don't know your name, Betty, Betty Andrew and Betty for uh, helping set up. Uh, the one thing that uh, I know, and anyone who gives presentations like this, is if anything's going to go wrong, it's definitely going to go wrong. And uh, so, but it's not going to go wrong, because we fixed everything. So, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I don't want to think about how many times I've given a talk to uh, the Toronto Centre. Uh, but uh, uh, I do remember uh, many uh, times giving talks at the McLaughlin Planetarium and actually giving a few talks about Voyager, so we're sort of going uh, back in time a little bit. Um, my fascination with Voyager um, is that it was uh, something that happened you know, in the late 70s. It was a very exciting mission, great potential. And uh, I was at a point where uh, uh, I could follow it very closely. Uh, and so now that we are looking back 40 years, I thought it would be really nice to learn more about the mission itself and, uh, and share that with you. See, this is what you have at the beginning of your, your Facebook is you have a test of the audience. So we know things working. All right. Uh, so, the mission itself um, was uh, planned to learn more about the outer solar system, the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. 
Uh, think of this back in uh, being back in uh, uh, late, you know, beginning to plan these things in the late 60s. Uh, when the space program came along, uh, most of the planets were just little dots in telescopes, something that uh, could barely be resolved, uh, but not something that we could uh, actually learn a lot about. So the opportunity to actually send spacecraft to these planets uh, came about 60 years ago, you know, in the, uh, in, with, at the beginning of the space age. And uh, these two voyagers were, uh, were sent out to the outer planets. Uh, originally, uh, the plan was just to send spacecraft out to Jupiter and Saturn. Around the time that it was, uh, the program was in the planning stages, uh, nothing had been sent out beyond Mars. And uh, spacecraft back then, they didn't, la they didn't work very well. They didn't last very long. And a trip out to Jupiter and Saturn was going to take uh, the better part of, uh, of 10 years. So uh, this was a major challenge uh, for the people organizing this. So just to get an idea of scale, to send a plan um, something out to the, the outer planets, uh, you were looking at vast distances. So the Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun. And that equates to about 150 million kilometers. Mars isn't all that far away. On average, it's about uh, another half astronomical unit. But look at what happens when you go to Jupiter. You're talking about five astronomical units. Saturn, 10. Uranus, uh, well, round it to 20. Neptune, 30 astronomical units. So there's different aspects about uh, going out that far is uh, the major distances, the communications more difficult, uh, the power requirements are difficult if you're depending on power from the sun, and uh, certainly the light levels are very, very low. If you're 30 times farther away from the sun than we are here, uh, there's not a lot of light visible if you want to take pictures. Looking through a telescope, this is basically what you see. Jupiter is a fairly large size in, in large telescopes, but once you get down to uh, Uranus and Neptune, they're just little dots. <clears throat> All right, I want to talk a little bit about how you get out to the planets. Uh, and I just saw the Star Wars movie last weekend and couldn't... Uh, couldn't help but noticing that all of the spacecraft in Star Wars have an infinite fuel supplies. <laughs> Their engines are always on. Uh, I want to impress upon you that that's not real, okay? You don't turn your spacecraft on and fire its engine forever. Uh, the other aspect is that they don't, you know, there's no Bernoulli's principle in a vacuum, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, but. Anyway, to get something out to the outer planets takes a lot of energy, but all of that energy is expended by the main rocket. So if anything happens with the main rocket, you don't get all of your push out towards Mars or Jupiter and Saturn, uh, it's the end of the mission. Uh, plus, there is a, a very efficient way to get out to Mars, the most energy efficient way is by following what's called a home and transfer orbit. And again, it's not, you know, point the rocket at Mars and fire the engines and then, you know, turn the engines off when you get to Mars or anything like that. Essentially, an orbit to Mars is an orbit around the sun. So this, uh, to go to Mars, uh, you wait until Mars is at a specific spot in its orbit, and you leave the planet Earth, and you follow this essentially elliptical orbit out to the, with just enough energy to get out to, the, out to Mars's orbit. And when you reach that point, you've timed it such that Mars is there. That's how we've sent all of our spacecraft to Mars, and that's how probably we'll send people to Mars. The problem with this is it's, it's energy efficient. The problem with this is that to come home again, you have to wait until Earth 
and Mars are in the right spot, and that can take many months. So that's why we talk about nine months to get out to send people to Mars, probably, or any spacecraft. But if you want to come home again, you have to wait until Earth and Mars are set up again so that you can create this home in orbit to, uh, to come back. Yeah. You're expending fuel here to put yourself in an orbit around the sun that looks like this. You may make very small adjustments, but those you have very little margin because you can't carry a lot of fuel because that's a lot of weight and, and that's the problem. So if you don't, all of your energy expenditure is right here. So this allows you to get out to Mars and potentially this could be used to go to the outer planets. <coughs> but uh, to make that trip in a home in orbit out to the outer planets, it's a large arcing orbit and it would take many years. So back around uh, the late 50s, early 60s, it was determined that uh, you could actually speed up the process to the outer planets by using what's called gravity assist. The timing of this was very interesting. It's very coincidental that with the gravity assist and, and something else which made the whole Voyager thing happen. But essentially gravity assist works this way. When you're traveling in your spacecraft, let's say here's Jupiter, but let's say for the moment Jupiter is not moving. It's just something sitting out in space. So as you approach Jupiter, the gravity of Jupiter would accelerate your spacecraft and the fact that the, the large gravity, the large masses there, it would uh, deflect your trajectory. But as you leave Jupiter, the same amount of attraction that you had as you approached Jupiter, Jupiter would pull you back the same amount so that you wouldn't gain anything. Your velocity in towards Jupiter would be the same as the velocity once you left Jupiter. The only thing is uh, it's your direction would change. If you do that to Jupiter, which is moving around the sun, then you can steal a bit of velocity from Jupiter. As you pass by the planet, Jupiter will give you a little bit of its velocity. So the velocity that you have when you have gone past Jupiter will be a little bit more than when you arrive. You'll still get the, the deflection. But what this means is that you can use the planets to not only speed up and get to the outer planets faster, but you can also use a planet to sort of change your direction. So if, if Jupiter's here and Saturn's here, you can pass by. If you go in the right direction, it will speed you up and send you off to Saturn. The first time they used this was uh, for Mariner 10 in the early 1970s. Not only can a planet speed you up, but it can slow you down. And that's one of the problems with going to the inner planets, <coughs> is you have to slow down. Going to the outer planets, you, you need uh, a lot of velocity, but uh, falling into the gravity well of the sun, it's a challenge to slow down. And what was used was a gravitational assist at Venus to slow Mariner down, and the result was they didn't need a huge Titan launch vehicle they could use a smaller Atlas vehicle. It was cheaper and uh, it made it uh, the mission possible. Also, uh, before Voyager went, there were two missions, Pioneer 10 and 11, which were really uh, initial test missions, uh, not very sophisticated spacecraft, which passed by Jupiter and Saturn, and they also proved the concept of the gravity assist. <clears throat> All right, so with this new found uh, way to move around the solar system, it was also determined in the mid-60s that by coincidence, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were all nicely aligned so that a spacecraft could 
gravity assist by Jupiter and go on to Saturn, and then gravity assist at Saturn to go to Uranus and then to Neptune. This align, I mean, if, if Jupiter's here and Saturn's on the other side of the sun, then you can't use the gravity assist to go to Saturn. So uh, this alignment of the, of the four uh, outer planets happens every 175 years. So if this had happened in the 50s, and the space program start, you know, the capability was in the 60s and 70s, and the gravity assist and was determined, we still would have been out of luck. We would have had to somehow go one planet at a time. You would have had to have more, more than a couple missions. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, <coughs> and Neptune, and even Pluto uh, set up. Uh, for a potential uh, mission which was called the Grand Tour. So the Grand Tour was defined, uh, a spacecraft uh, was designed called uh, the TOPS, the thermal, geez, I don't remember what the heck that thing was called, but uh, it uh, was a very sophisticated uh, spacecraft, uh, sort of what Voyager ultimately looked like, but the downfall was uh, that around the turn of the decade, just after the moon landing, uh, the price tag came in at a billion dollars. And uh, right around that time, the Nixon government was finding money for the shuttle program. And so the Grand Tour was uh, uh, canceled. But uh, what rose out of the Grand Tour was something called Mariner Jupiter Saturn. And essentially what that was, was a, uh, a reconfiguring of the Grand Tour, not building a brand new spacecraft, but taking the Mariner 10 bus, the major guts of the Mariner 10 spacecraft, and coming up with a Jupiter and Saturn mission. And uh, this was uh, found to be favorable. And uh, in December 1972, the first team of scientists met at JPL in uh, California to start to discuss the mission. Now, they still knew that Uranus and Neptune were in a favorable position for gravi gravitational assist. And so they decided that they would tell the bosses at NASA that, you know, this is a Jupiter-Saturn mission. But in all of their planning, they were planning for a Uranus and Neptune as well. And kind of the, you know, if we get by Jupiter and everything's fine, if we get by Saturn, everything's fine, maybe we'll be able to get the extra money if the spacecraft is healthy enough to make it out to Uranus and Neptune. So here is what the Voyager <coughs> uh, mission looked like. The two spacecraft leaving the Earth uh, in the, the summer of uh, 77. And essentially taking 12 years to ultimately get out to Neptune. Without gravitational assist, uh, Voyager would be reaching Neptune right about now. It's a 40-year trip without gravitational assist to get out to Neptune. And that's a lot of time on the warranty for us. Although, well, a 70s spacecraft, you never know. They're still working, so. Uh, now, they had certain objectives to, uh, to the missions. And uh, this was the first major flight to, uh, you know, to the outer planets. Uh, there was a lot of interest in one of Saturn's moons, called, and the moon is Titan. Uh, it's uh, larger, uh, it's, one, it's, large, it's nearly as large as Mercury. It has an atmosphere, the only moon in the solar system that has an atmosphere. So there was great interest in passing close to Titan and analyzing that. Unfortunately, uh, to get to Titan, you had to sacrifice that a spacecraft for the Uranus and Neptune mission. In other words, to go by Saturn a certain way to get to Uranus did not take them close enough to Titan. So the plan was <coughs> to send Voyager 1 on a trajectory that would pass very close to Titan, would pass behind it so that they could pass radio signals through its atmosphere and learn a whole bunch about uh, the, the, the moon. 
but that trajectory would have kicked it up out and out of the plane of the solar system and away from Uranus and Neptune. So they would only do this if they had two healthy spacecraft at Saturn. If for some reason one spacecraft did not make it to Saturn, then they would have decided to still do the Titan flyby, but then you wouldn't have had a spacecraft to make it to Uranus and Neptune. So a lot was depending on two, success, two healthy spacecraft making it to, uh, to Saturn and performing the, the Titan pass. Now, this is uh, the only graph in my talk. I always like it when people say, this is the only math in the talk tonight. But this is kind of neat. I found it interesting. To make it out to Jupiter, you need enough velocity to essentially escape the Earth's gravity. And essentially, if you wanted to, you could do a Holman, Holman maneuver and get out to Jupiter. But then the, Earth's grav the sun's gravity would pull you back. Uh, to make it out of the solar system, you need what's called escape velocity, solar system escape velocity. And this blue line is essentially that velocity. And notice how it's very high when you're close to the sun, 35, 40 kilometers per second. And it drops dramatically once you get very, very far away from the sun. So when Voyager 2 was launched from the Earth, it was given a velocity of about 36 kilometers per second. So it's headed out towards Jupiter. Notice as it was heading out towards Jupiter, the sun was pulling it back. Such that once, by the time it reached Jupiter, it no longer had enough escape velocity to leave the solar system. But look at the velocity that the gravitational assist at Jupiter gave. Punched it back up into the solar system escape velocity. And for the rest of the trip, it, was, it had escape velocity. So again, as it's heading out to Saturn, the sun's pulling it back, not as much. Once it reaches Saturn, Saturn gives it a, uh, another boost. And the same with Uranus and Neptune. I found that kind of an interesting graph once you can uh, sort of wrap your mind about it a little bit. So the whole gravitational assist made, uh, made it possible. Yep? If, uh, if it stayed below the blue, would it follow the path back to where it came? Essentially? Um, the well, right now, it, it, it potentially, I don't know, it, it, the problem is it would not have left the solar system. And if it was, if it was down... Uh, if it was down here, then it probably would not have had enough to make it out to the outer planets. Yeah, yeah. Again, the sun, the sun is always pulling it back. All right, talk a little bit about the spacecraft. Uh, they have a nice model at uh, JPL. Um, and uh, I've been looking forward to seeing it for a long, long time. And uh, it's, uh, it's not an engineering model, but it's a model that they made. It's in the press room there, so it was always... Uh, saw that during the, uh, the press activities during the missions. So the spacecraft mainly it consists of a, a, as I said, the Mariner 4 bus. Uh, the thing about the, the spacecraft, the Voyager spacecraft, compared to the previous spacecraft, is it had a lot more computing power, and it could make decisions on its own. The uh, previous Mariner spacecraft were pretty dumb, and they needed instructions from the ground all the time. Voyager was a little bit smarter than that, and uh, if it did not understand something or was concerned about its health, it could go into a safety mo safe mode and call home for help. And this was one of the first uh, spacecraft that had that capability. Uh, this is the big uh, transmission, radio transmission uh, uh, dish for talking to Earth. Um, now Voyager, as I said, was going very, very far away from the sun. Uh, you can't use solar panels on a mission that far away from the sun. So it had nuclear fuel, I believe it's plutonium, in what's called an RTG, or a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Uh, same kind of things that they used on the moon for their experiments, and a lot of the, uh, uh, the Galileo, the Cassini, uh, a lot of the spacecraft that went out to the outer solar system used uh, this kind of fuel. Uh, so what, essentially what it does is it, uh, it gives off a lot of heat, 
which is then converted to electricity. It's not very uh, efficient. It's only about 10% efficient, but it's enough to give about 400 watts of electricity, which isn't, isn't a lot. Uh, the science instruments are on this side mainly, the, uh, the cameras, uh, which are not only in light uh, weight frequencies, but infrared and ultraviolet, and also a photo photopolarimeter, which can measure the brightness of, of things. And there were some other uh, experiments which essentially analyzed the environment, the particles, the, uh, mag the magnetic fields, uh, various things, that, you know, cosmic rays, plasmas. Uh, essentially, it was an opportunity to see what the environment of the solar system is like at those distances from the sun. Uh, here's uh, one of the little uh, thrusters that uh, are on Voyager. And even though 99.999% of the energy was given to Voyager from the main rocket, and then through the gravitational assists, it needs these little thrusters to keep the big dish antenna pointed at Earth. And so in space, things tend to move around a little bit. So the main use of the thrusters were to do that. Uh, but also, uh, on the way out, there were, uh, they would take pictures of planets and stars, and mainly planets against the stars, to determine that they're going in the right direction. And they would make small adjustments to their trajectory using these thrusters. But they didn't, uh, you know, they only had a finite amount of fuel. And the only reason that they are still uh, active 40 years after launch is because they were very frugal uh, with their attitude control fuel. So launch, two large spacecraft. Uh, the first La the first spacecraft that was launched, surprisingly, was Voyager 2. And this confused the press to know that, you know, it's just very confusing. But uh, based on when Voyager 2 and Voyager 1 were launched, Voyager, Voyager 1 actually caught up to and passed Voyager 2. And so Voyager 1 was the first one to reach Jupiter and Saturn. So here is Voyager all um, folded up nicely to fit into the uh, payload shroud. So you see the uh, fuel, the, the uh, fuel, the RTGs down one side, all of the scientific uh, uh, experiments, the booms down this side, and all of these would unfold nicely with springs and, and all this other, uh, these contraptions once it was uh, out in space, hopefully. So the large uh, spacecraft and the payload shroud uh, put on top of the rocket, and off we go. Now, both spacecraft had uh, interesting experiences during launch, very different experiences. Uh, Voyager 2's computer system was running when it was launched, and the whole idea is this, the computer was supposed to... Um, assess things like attitude and various things about the spacecraft and <coughs> I guess do things based on that. But that was for flight. For some reason they had it on for launch. And you can imagine at launch there's great accelerations, there's jiggling, you're, it's just a very dynamic environment. So this confused the Voyager 2 computer. It shut down its main computer. It opened up, it started up a backup computer. It, it, start, it did a whole bunch of stuff that it shouldn't have done. And so the result was that uh, they didn't lose it, as you know, uh, but it was delayed in opening up all of its uh, you know, booms and everything once it was separated from the rocket. And they had two or three days of let's just say nail-biting time, trying to communicate with Voyager 2 and get it into a stable position where they could continue the mission. Uh, there was some concern that the, uh, the main science boom did not open enough and click into, into place. So they did actually uh, increase the spring action on the Voyager 1 spacecraft before they launched it. But uh, Voyager 2 uh, was on its way. Voyager 1, they nearly lost. Not because of anything Voyager 1 did, but because something the rocket did. And for some reason, the, the, uh, uh, the second stage of the rocket uh, was inefficient. 
and burned a lot more fuel than it should have to get into orbit. And once it's in orbit, then it starts up again to send it on at the right time, pointing in the right direction to send it to Jupiter. And they nearly ran out of fuel. In other words, they nearly didn't have enough speed to get to Jupiter. And if that had happened, it just would have got partially out to Jupiter and then would have fallen back to the sun. And again, it was a nail-biting thing because they were monitoring the fuel amount and the velocity. And essentially, it would, it would burn the engine right to depletion of the fuel. And, and then if it had enough velocity, fine. If it didn't. And it sh automatically shut down three seconds before they ran out of fuel. So that's cutting it a little too close because essentially it was 1,750 pounds of fuel that they had lost from uh, the first uh, burn. So anyway, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, both, uh, um, well, very fortunate, but nearly. And again, go back to the whole grand tour. If two, spacecraft, two healthy spacecraft do not make it to Saturn, then there's no Uranus and Neptune. Uh, there is, uh, they, they, they did build three Voyagers, and the third one is on display at the Air and Space Museum in uh, uh, Washington. So I'm watching all this and cutting out newspapers and whatever and uh, enjoying it. And uh, this was the first picture taken of the Earth and Moon, looking back a couple days after launch. Uh, and this really gave the Voyager scientists a bit of a, a, tr um, a, a something that, to look forward to. I mean, if this is what we can get looking back at Earth and Moon, what, what are we going to get um, when we get to the, uh, the outer planets? So as I said, Jupiter, uh, sorry, <coughs> Voyager 1 passed uh, Voyager 2. And uh, about uh, six months into the mission, nearly lost Voyager 2 again. And what happened was uh, there was a, an error on the ground. Uh, there's a, a time signal that they had to, um, that Voyager is running on. And they have to reset that, and they didn't. And through a series of failures, um, the main radio receiver on Voyager failed. And so it switched to the backup. But there was a fault in that receiver such that the spacecraft was not able to calibrate the frequency that it received from, from the Earth, meaning that it could only receive one frequency, and the transmitter on Earth had to adjust it so that Voyager could hear that frequency. Now, the rotation of the Earth rot affects the frequency of the radio signal that you send out. So for the rest of the mission, Somebody on the Earth had to calculate the exact radio frequency that would be, leave, would be received at, uh, at Voyager based on distance and rotation of the Earth and all these other things. So it was a major, major headache, but obviously uh, they got it done. Anyway, how do we talk to Voyager? Well, the Earth is always turning, uh, and this is something that was set up uh, in the Apollo days. You know, the moon's up there, but the Earth is turning. So NASA set up this uh, uh, deep sky <coughs> navigation system, and th they set up three large radio transmitters and receivers uh, around the world, uh, one in Australia, one in Spain, and one in California. And here's the one in, in California. Uh, so as I say, we visited uh, JPL. There was an RASC tour to Southern California a few years ago. We visited JPL, we visited uh, Palomar, Mount Wilson. It was a great trip. And in JPL, there is a, uh, a communications room. And when you look up at the big screen, you could see at the time that Voyager 1 was not only, we were not only receiving information from Voyager 1, but we were sending information to Voyager 1 as well. Uh, and Cassini, we were receiving information. Um, so that was, Kind of neat to see. Poor, poor Cassini. All right. So we have two working spacecraft. We reached Jupiter in uh, 1979. Here's the trajectory uh, of Voyager 1 going by Jupiter. Uh, as you can see, it, it came within the uh, orbit of Io and came very close to, to Io. Uh, each spacecraft passed through the shadow of Jupiter. 
And <coughs> just depending on where the moon was, uh, you could either get rather close to it, like Callisto, passed right by Callisto, passed right by Ganymede, uh, but Europa wasn't well placed for, for Voyager 1. Voyager 2, uh, to get to Saturn, passed out a little farther from Jupiter, uh, passed very close to Ganymede, and, and had a better view of, of uh, Europa. And you can see that the, the pass through the planet, <coughs> sorry, it's, it's a matter of days. The approach is, uh, is, is a matter of weeks as this little dot gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But the excitement is a matter of uh, essentially two days to pass through the, the uh, planetary system. So here's a view of, uh, of Jupiter as we approach, probably better than uh, what was visible from uh, uh, Earth telescopes at the time. Uh, a lot of movies were put together showing the motion of the, the clouds around the great red spot. By this point, the Voyager scientists were already blown away. They were seeing a lot more than they even imagined. And, uh, you know, a lot of them said that you would think that you had seen everything and then we reached another planet or we reached another moon. And, and the one thing they began to understand was we cannot predict what we're going to see. All we know is that we're going to be surprised by what, by what Voyager shows us. So it took pictures like this, a resolution that we uh, had never seen before, uh, learned a lot about the atmosphere of the planet, the moons of the planet, close-ups of uh, Io, uh, an amazing uh, moon, which was uh, so soon discovered sulfur volcanoes, so the only, <coughs> only other active, uh, at the time we thought only the other active volcanic uh, moon in, in the solar system. Uh, Europa, which had a cracked, uh, very flat cracked surface, not many craters, so a very young surface. Uh, Ganymede with uh, rills and cracks, but also flat areas, and uh, Callisto. A very interesting service. So we have four moons of Jupiter, all extremely different. Uh, they took, as they passed <coughs> through the shadow, they took a, a long exposure looking for lightning, and they discovered a ring around the planet. So that was uh, that was something. Quite the, the first act uh, at Jupiter was was quite amazing. What would they find at Saturn? <coughs> Uh, so here is the Voyager 1 trajectory to pass by Titan. And as you can see, they had to, when they passed closely by Titan, it took them below the planet and the gravitational assist shot them up and out of the ecliptic. Um, the Voyager 2, therefore, uh, passed down uh, through the northern part of the planet and uh, off to, to Saturn. So this is a nice little review of this is the, ring the activity Saturn and its many uh, at Voyager 1 at Saturn. From 17 million kilometers away in space. Now we move in 10 times closer as we prepare for Voyager 1's encounter. This computer-generated film takes us along. We join Voyager 31 hours before closest approach. The spacecraft carries 10 instruments to make high-resolution studies. Before Voyager reaches Saturn, it approaches huge Titan, largest moon in the solar system, and one that has an appreciable atmosphere. Voyager will fly behind Titan, bigger than the planet Mercury. As Voyager vanishes behind Titan and then reappears, its instruments study the way sunlight changes and its radio signals pass through the atmosphere en route to Earth, allowing measurements impossible from Earth. After passing Titan, Voyager will once more turn its scan platform to Saturn and its exciting rings. As we approach the planet, we dip below the rings and see sunlight pass through them, providing a backlighted view. Meanwhile, 
Voyager will study other satellites, such as Tethys. This great block of ice is of an entirely different class than other satellites we've studied. As Voyager 1 draws ever closer to Saturn, it dips toward the South Pole. And Voyager finally flies past the evening side of Saturn, only 124,000 kilometers from the clouds. Then it disappears once again from our view here on Earth to make the same kinds of measurements that were made behind Titan. Another of Saturn's celestial escorts is my icy Mimas. Voyager continues past Saturn, searching the night side for signs of lightning and auroras. And now the spacecraft begins to climb upward again, and then the sun and Earth reappear, and we reacquire the radio signal. Voyager crosses the rings again through a narrow slot swept clear by the satellite Dione. The next satellite target is Rhea. Voyager performs some fancy footwork, tracking the speeding satellite as a gunner might lead his flying target. As Voyager continues to climb out of the Saturn system, it performs a roll maneuver to keep the antenna pointed at Earth and to prepare to measure the environment around Saturn. The instruments, meanwhile, continue to study the planet. Titan, again, comes under the scrutiny of Voyager's cameras. Almost 22 hours after closest approach to Saturn, Voyager maneuvers to scan the entire sky so fields and particles instruments can characterize the environment. First, a small roll maneuver, then a full circle on the yaw axis, then almost two full circles on the roll axis. Before returning, to lock onto the star called Vega. Saturn's most mysterious satellite, Iapetus. The leading edge is six times darker than its trailing edge, and there's no satisfactory explanation. Steadily leaving Saturn, the spacecraft continues to look back over its shoulder at a constantly receding planet. Voyager is heading out of the solar system. Okay, so some of the things they found, uh, amazing detail in the rings, uh, thousands and thousands of individual ringlets, uh, strange dark markings in, uh, above the rings, uh, what they so-called spokes, which uh, rotated with the, uh, the rings, uh, strange uh, braided rings, this is the F ring, the outer, outer ring of Saturn, uh, showing this very strange braiding effect. And little, little moons, which essentially shepherd or keep the rings in, uh, in line and in shape. Uh, they found several of these. With the photopolarimeter, they actually watched the rings occult or watched a star go behind the rings. And they took uh, essentially measurements of the brightness of the star as it went behind the rings. And it gave this uh, very detailed a uh, representation of, uh, of the various rings, the densities and uh, thicknesses. Uh, Voyager has uh, infrared and ultraviolet cameras. And when you take an ultraviolet picture, uh, you really can't show ultraviolet because it's not a, a visible frequency. So what they do is they take the picture and then they can show the differences in the, comp in the components of materials in the rings by using false colors. And uh, that's why you get these rather bizarre looking photos. But the, when you see something like this, it's, you know that it's uh, taken in a frequency of light other than, than visible. The Voyager 1 satellite has sent back another series of photographs, close-ups of Saturn, almost a billion miles away from Earth. Here's this from Roy Neal.
The scientists are both excited and puzzled by these pictures. 128 black and white stop motion photographs show the rings of Saturn revolving. They also show four of its moons. The puzzle is that there are black lines like spokes in the inner rings, and no one's been able to figure out what they are. Two days ago, the Voyager 1 shot this fuzzy picture of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. The spacecraft will fly within 2,500 miles of this moon next Tuesday. And this is Saturn at a range of 8 million miles. The shadows cast by its rings look like a superhighway girdling the equator. Two moons, Tethys and Dione, can be seen large dots to the left. And the shadow of Tethys, a bluish dot at the lower right corner of the photograph. Roy Neal, NBC News, Los Angeles. I'm Harvey Kirk. Thank you, Harvey. Um, yeah, so uh, it was great to see that kind of a report on the evening news, but you know, a lot of us wanted more. Um, Chris Malicki, who uh, uh, longtime Toronto Center member, he's at Mississauga now, actually wrote to the the newspaper and complained about the lack of coverage in the newspaper, and uh, they published his uh, his letter along with a picture of Saturn. And it was around this time that I decided that I'd like to learn a lot more, but I'd also like to share a lot more about things like the Voyager uh, system. So this is really why I started Astronomy Toronto back in 1981. And Paul Deans, who was a producer at the Planetarium, always went down to JPL to get all of the pictures and all of the information for a Planetarium show. So he'd come back with stacks of, of pictures and he'd be up on all of the discoveries, so it was very easy to get him into the studio to uh, to do a quick show. So uh, we def we covered Saturn and uh, and uh, Uranus the the passes at Saturn and Uranus that way. Now this is the scan platform with the uh, the cameras, and it essentially moves this way and moves this way, and. Uh, you saw with Voyager 1, it, it passed behind the planet. And then when it comes out again, and it can see Earth, it can start transmitting. When Voyager 2 came out from behind the planet and started taking pictures, the pictures were all blank. And they quickly realized that the scan platform had frozen. And this was not good. Uh, because, you know, if you can't control the scan platform, then you can't take pictures at Uranus and Neptune. So it took a couple of days before they figured it out, that they used engineering models and whatever and realized that they were moving too quickly in too many different directions. So if they just slowed it down a little bit, they would be fine. And it took a couple of days before they got a picture back of uh, Saturn looking back up towards it. So sigh of relief. Uh, the science started again. They lost two days worth of photos though. Uh, at Saturn, just at uh, closest approach, uh, which was, uh, was a tough loss. So Voyager 2 um, took uh, these, some of these photos, another picture of Titan. Uh, this is an interesting moon, it's called Mimas, with a very large crater. Probably you would think that something that made a crater that big would uh, break this, the moon apart, but other people had other theories. <laughs> but again, that one broke up too, so. Uh, just a, an overview of some of the things that they found at, uh, at Saturn. Uh, the, you know, Voyager not only uh, told us a lot about a lot of the moons that we knew about, but it discovered another 50% of uh, natural satellites around these planets. And, uh, and looked at them as well. So it was just a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of detail. And uh, one of my favorite pictures all, all, all time, looking back at, at Saturn after Voyager 1. Uh, so Uranus. So we're going from 1981 to 1986, so five years to get to, uh, to Uranus. And Uranus being on its side, uh, when you approached Uranus, it was like you were approaching a, a bullseye. And... Uh, we're much farther away from the sun now, so there's less uh, light. Uh, the transmission rates have to be less because of the distance. Radio transmission rates are, are less at the farther you go. So what they did, they had five years to improve 
the, uh, the capability of hearing Voyager, so they actually enhanced some of the uh, radio receivers, uh, especially in Australia, but they also set them up so that if two radio receivers could see Uranus at the same time, they used both of them, and then they combined the signals. Uh, this is uh, just showing the, uh, uh, where they ultimately targeted to find Uranus, uh, to go by Uranus to get to, to Neptune. And notice that if they were out by a couple hundred kilometers, then this is the fuel penalty in kilograms. So not, not a lot, but uh, this would be the uh, ideal point that they targeted, and this is where they uh, ended up pointing. So they were quite accurate in their ability to, to point where they wanted to go. One of the interesting things I find about the Uranus and Neptune passes is that the light levels were so low and you had this 19, early 1970s video, TV video in the camera. So the technology was, was so, you know, 70s. Uh, and they were, you're talking about taking pictures of a planet in what essentially is like deep twilight on Earth. And to do that, they had to take longer exposures. So they actually reprogrammed the computer to take longer exposures. But because of the, the, the speed at some point, especially if they're very close to moons, you would get smearing. So they actually figured out a way to pan. You know how some people pan when a race car goes by? They actually panned the spacecraft by tweaking it or nodding it using little thrusters or even uh, other methods. So they, they figured all of this out uh, to be able to, they, you know, the, moving the scan platform, it wasn't precise enough. They had to move the entire spacecraft and they actually reprogrammed the little thrusters to give out little puffs at specific times. So they had five years to figure all this out. But, so here's an example of uh, the way it, if, when it passed by a, a moon like Mimas, it actually, during a 1.44 second exposure, it actually, the whole spacecraft just tilted the right amount. And they got very, and it worked. The other thing was uh, the radio transmission. At that distance, they, they had to, to uh, decrease the radio transmission rate. And so to send an entire picture would have taken hours. So what they did is they figured out how to compress the data. And so what they did, you know, each, each picture is made up of pixels and each pixel has eight digits or, or whatever. What they did is instead of giving the brightness of each pixel, which took a certain amount of space, is they just, they just sent the difference. And as you can see, a certain number of pixel elements taking this much, they could compress it down to this much. So it was, uh, I thought it was brilliant. Moving in towards Uranus in ultraviolet, you know, this isn't what you'd see with your naked eye, but using ultraviolet, they were able to see some uh, interesting things. And that's the, the pole. I don't remember if it was the North Pole or the South Pole, but that's the, the, the pole. They were able to discover, uh, rings had been discovered in, in uh, 1977, but they were able to discover moons and uh, some extra rings. And this is one of the longest exposures that they took, and any astrophotographer will know if you have star trails, then something's moving. And in this case, it's the uh, spacecraft. And uh, I think this one was a several minute exposure of the ring, and the detail in the rings is spectacular. The problem with shooting the rings is that they were essentially as reflective as charcoal. So you imagine going out with a, a, a very, a 1970s video camera and trying to shoot your driveway uh, in deep twilight. That's essentially the problem that they had. While you're moving. While you're moving. Yeah. Uh, I believe this is uh, Titania. Uh, interesting structure, faults. I'm just going to move through that for time. This is a very interesting moon. This is Mimas. Uh, and this is the one that Oh, sorry, thank you, Miranda. See, that's why. <laughs> um, Miranda, it's a, a very interesting moon because it essentially looks like it has been blown apart and then stuck together again. Uh, the geology in this uh, was fascinating. 
And again, this, this, is the one, this is the picture that required the most panning to get a clear picture. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's very, very sharp. Finally, Neptune. Because there, were, there wasn't another planet after Neptune, they could choose their trajectory through the Neptune system. And they wanted to go by Triton, the large moon of, uh, of Neptune. And to do that, they had to just skim over the North Pole. They actually got so close, they got a little concerned that they might uh, hit some of the atmospheric uh, molecules as they made that close pass. But there was a lot of interest in Triton because there was some thought that maybe Triton and Pluto were uh, related somehow. Uh, the thoughts about Neptune were, we're not going to see anything very exciting. Uh, and then there were these, there's this very dark, uh, dark, dark blue spot was uh, discovered. Very, very high velocity winds in the upper atmosphere. And uh, amazing details of, uh, of clouds near sunset. Um, uh, rings around Neptune as well. Um, did Voyager discover those? They were ring arcs before Voyager. Oh, okay. They okay, yeah. So there, you can see there's, there are clumps there. Uh, but yeah, Voyager, as, as Paul says, I, I'd forgotten about that. And Triton. And as you look at these pictures of Triton, does that not look kind of Pluto-like? So this uh, very, very successful pass, final pass uh, at Neptune, and uh, a nice parting view of a crescent Triton and a, cri a crescent Neptune. So essentially, the Voyager mission is over. Um, as a, a final act, it was suggested by, uh, I believe, Carl Sagan uh, to take uh, a solar system family portrait of all of the moons, of all the planets, I mean. And uh, I think Mercury was a little too close to the sun. Uh, the Earth was visible, but on a ray of, of, uh, of sunlight. Uh, and then they turned the cameras off because there was nothing else to see. Now, voyagers are on their way out of the solar system. Uh, nothing to stop them. They will continue. Essentially, they've left the sun, so they're now in orbit around the center of the galaxy. Uh, if they were headed towards the closest star, they would reach in at about 40,000 years, and they're not headed towards the closest star. So you never know. If they are discovered by someone else, uh, it was thought that we should leave a calling card, and that was uh, the, the golden record. Uh, again, another Carl Sagan project. They had a budget of $25,000 in six weeks to put together the top hits and sounds of planet Earth, and uh, 100 pictures and greetings in 50 languages. And uh, there's one of them being attached to the outside. It has instructions on it. It actually has a, a needle that you would use to, uh, to play the record. Uh, and one of the pictures has a Toronto uh, characteristic, the old uh, Terminal 1 out at the airport. Uh, but ultimately, they are leaving our, uh, the influence or the heliosphere of the sun, and Voyager 1 has now passed that shock wave and uh, is now uh, in what you would call interstellar space, and Voyager 2 is heading that way as well. I think it, within the next couple of years, uh, it will leave the influence of the sun. A couple of years ago, <coughs> uh, in 2013, um, it was actually, the signal from Voyager was actually spotted with a radio telescope, which is kind of a neat thing. Um, sort of a radio signal turned into a picture. And you, many of you might have heard that uh, at, on the 40th anniversary, there was a big contest that NASA had to send some message to, uh, to Voyager. And there's the winning message there out of thousands of entries. And uh, William Shatner, I guess, got a chance to hit the button which sent the message out. So Voyager, you're not alone. Actually, you're very alone, but anyway. <laughs> and then just recently, um, this came out. The primary thrusters are degrading, and once they are, and so they're using up more fuel than, than, than they would want. They, there's enough fuel on the spacecraft to last them to about 2025, but then if they can't point the dish towards the Earth, then we lose contact. So the idea was to use these backup thrusters. They're really <coughs> thrusters that were used 
not to keep the, keep the attitude, but to actually position the spacecraft during the uh, redirecting it during uh, maneuvers when they were navigating. So they fired these up and they work. So this will uh, add another couple years of life to the, the spacecraft, hopefully. So what's next for our friends? Well, they leave a great legacy because all of these missions here use the technology uh, that Voyager was developed by Voyager. <coughs> so missions to the, more to the outer planets and to Mars and uh, Mercury and to Pluto all used uh, Voyager technology. And these are some of the things that uh, we saw from Galileo and from, uh, from Cassini. So these are now worlds that we, uh, we know much more about. Uh, and certainly there's, there's, a, our missions, there's a mission being developed to go to Europa and hopefully at some point another one to go to Titan. Well, there is another one just announced to go to Titan and uh, hopefully uh, other moons at some point. Uh, if you haven't seen The Farthest yet, it's a great two-hour uh, documentary that just came out on Voyager. It's on Netflix. It's on uh, uh, probably uh, Apple, iTunes, and it's uh, shown on PBS every now and then. It's a great, uh, it's very, very good. And with that, I'll thank you very much. Brings back lots and lots of memories. 40 years ago, it's hard to believe all the excitement of the 70s and, uh, as you say, the legacy that has been uh, spawned as a result. Oh. And the legacy that it has spawned as a result. Uh, I'm not going to hold this for very long because I'm sure Randy will entertain some questions. We'll let him uh, hold the floor for another 10 minutes or so and then we'll hand it to Ralph and go at it from there. So, What, <clears throat> what happens to the team that is looking after Voyager between each of these uh, uh, encounters of the different planets because there's a long space of time between them. Um, pr um, I, I would think that a lot of them would go off to work on other projects. Uh, so there'd be an intense period of time during the flyby, but yes, the five years between um, uh, Saturn and Uranus and then Uranus and Neptune. Uh, they're, they're always monitoring the spacecraft. Certainly they had a lot to do between Saturn and Uranus to prepare for the uh, the Uranus one with all of the, the changes that we made. But yeah, they wouldn't have the same amount of team. The, primarily the, the ones that uh, took, took care of, uh, of the care and feeding of the spacecraft could be loaned out to other projects. Certainly the scientists, they're still working on, on Voyager material. So you've got, you know, you've got the, uh, uh, the, the team from the manufacturer of the spacecraft and you've got the people at JPL who are monitoring the spacecraft, then you have all the scientists. And so I would think a lot of the JPL people who monitored the spacecraft, they would be farmed out. Yep. Yeah, was it Voyager, was it the Voyagers that discovered all the radiation around Jupiter? And if so, did that give any tense moments? Um, actually, in, in, uh, I read and in Farthest, uh, there is a part where one of the... Uh, managers says that not long before Voyager uh, left, and I think it probably came from the Pioneer 10 and, and 11 missions, that's when they discovered that there was a lot more radiation, especially with Voyager 1, because it was going to in go inside of Io's uh, orbit. And so they needed to protect a lot of the electronics from this radiation. And the, it's a great interview. The fellow says that, well, normally we'd go out and we'd get various materials and they would be checked and all this other stuff, whatever. I didn't have time. So I said, well, what if we just use aluminum foil? And they said, yeah, yeah, aluminum foil would work. So the guy had to ask his wife, where do I get aluminum foil? And he, oh, go to the store. Oh, okay, I'll go to the store. And they got all this and they wrapped it and, and apparently it worked. So I don't know if NASA quality control actually signed off on it or... Where do I get aluminum foil? That's a, that's a rocket scientist for you. All right, so I have a feeling you uh, are not going to give me an unequivocal answer for this, but if you have to rate the contributions of the Voyager missions against, let's say, the moon missions, which do you think had a greater contribution to our understanding of the solar system? 
You mean the manned missions? Uh, yes. Well, it's kind of apples and oranges, isn't it? Um, I think all of what I, what I like to you know, look at, what they knew in the 60s. Like, go back and find a textbook from 1962 and open that up and, uh, like George J. Bell or, you know, something like that, you know, and open it up and just see. And, and you know, I've, anyone who's written a textbook knows that what happened in the 70s threw textbooks out, what happened when Hubble was launched threw textbooks out. And so the whole Voyager thing was a textbook throwing out moment, uh, as was the moon missions. Uh, but uh, if you had gone back to that first mission, that first science meeting in 72 and told those scientists about the amount of ice and water that is in the outer solar system, they probably would have kicked you out because I don't think it was thought that there was, you know, that much. And, you know, I mean, you go back and you'll see the, what are the Saturn's rings made out of? Well, early it's, well, they're made of rock. And then, oh, they're made of ice and rock. And now we know it's totally ice, right? That kind of thing. So uh, I think Voyager was a, an aha type thing, just like the moon landings. Uh, spirit, we were talking a little bit earlier about spirit and opportunity, like totally changed what we know about the planet Mars. And uh, so I think it's, it, it's up there well, with the moon landings for sure, with the way we think about the outer solar system. And then for Cassini and Galileo, they set the stage for Cassini and Galileo, which have just, you know, expanded again another level of our, of our knowledge. So we need to go back to Uranus and Neptune, I'm afraid. We have to keep Andrew happy. Hey, thank you. Um, I just want to expand on that one slide you showed, December 1, 2017, when uh, I think it said uh, Voyager 37 or something. Okay. Oh, the uh, uh, just, starting just, up the thrusters, yeah? Yeah, just, uh, exactly. And I think this is a testimony to the quality of uh, <laughs> the manufacturing of, uh, manufacturing is not the right word, building of Voyager. Um, after it went past, uh, Uranus, they put it, put the computer into deep sleep in order to conserve energy. Yep. And um, they, in December, they sent out a signal after several decades, like 10 years, 20 years, to wake up the computer. And the signal took 19 minutes to reach Voyager from hours. Earth. 19 hours? Oh, okay, 19 yep. hours. And yep. they had to wait another 19 hours to get the response to see whether the computer was going to wake up. And it actually woke up, and that was such an incredible uh, moment in uh, science in general, because I put my computer at home to sleep, and I don't know whether it's going to wake up. <laughs> uh, 37 years or 20 years in outer space, minus uh, whatever temperature, it's something truly amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could say, well, gee, you know, my, I have a stereo system from 1975, and that thing isn't working, right? But again, building spacecraft is another you know, it's another world. Obviously, you say, well, why does it cost a billion dollars to send these spacecraft out? Because you have very, very smart people designing it for an environment that's very, very tough. So they, through the various previous spacecraft missions, they've learned what works and doesn't work, and they've built that into, into it. So they built uh, the backups. Notice how, how many times did Voyager have to use a backup system, radio receiver, computer, all these other things. So, you know, they've learned, it's sort of like why all the rockets blew, in the, blew up in the late 50s, because they were learning how to build and fly rockets. Now, rarely do they blow up. So, you know, but it still is a testimony of uh, the capability that they had back then. And they did with, with, I mean, they did what they did with what they had. The computer on Voyager had one, one, one hundred thousandth the capability of your smartphone. But again, they didn't use, they, they wrote the software. It's sort of like the, the lunar module had like only 75K or some, you know, some ridiculous amount of, of memory. Yeah, but they weren't running Windows. You know, they ran their own software. So, you know, it's, but yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And it is a great testimony, um, you know, the fact that it is still working.
I imagine the Voyager 1 and 2 has not yet reached cloud. No, that's, uh, that's on the order of light years, isn't it? Oh, no, no, I think it's gone past the order of light years. No, 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 no. It, it, it's only in our outskirts. There's no hard and fast, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. There's no hard and fast boundary associated with the odd cloud. It does stretch out uh, many tens of thousands of astronomical units out to about one light year. Okay. Is that, all right, is that considered to be beyond the Kuiper Belt? Oh, yeah. Okay. Is the considered part of our solar system? Yep. So it's not really outside of our solar system yet. It's, it's outside the influence of the sun. That's right. Oh, so the Oort cloud is not gravitationally bound to the sun? Yes, it is. It's very weak. Very weak. It doesn't okay. take very much to disturb things in the Oort cloud and walk about elsewhere. So they are moving coincident with the sun. Thank you. Um, Randy, what are they learning now that uh, it's past the heliopause and going into interstellar space almost? Well, I, they're going someplace that they've never been before. Uh, and there are some, some uh, detectors on the spacecraft that are still working. There, a lot of them are turned off. They're, they're, they're really trying to conserve power because the um, nuclear power source degrades over time. So th there was some concern that either they'd run out of power first or they'd run out of attitude control fuel. And it, they'll probably run out of uh, power first, I believe. Uh, but uh, I assume that they're just, uh, uh, they're not talking to it all the time. They're, I think they're talking to it daily or weekly. You can actually, I looked up, you can actually see the communication schedule for all the Voyagers. They're online, so you can see what, what they're doing. But I would just think that every now and then, the, whatever capability they have to de detect the, um, you know, the environment, make a measurement of the environment, that's what they're doing, because that's how they detected the fact that they passed uh, through the heliosphere, heliopause. <laughs> can, you just, <coughs> sorry. can you just expand on that? What happens when you pass through these different uh, zones that you, that you uh, highlighted on that final slide? The heliopause? Yeah, there was a terminal uh, terminal um, section, then the heliopause, and then right. well, we talked about the Oort cloud and things like that. Well, the, the sun has a certain influence, but as you reach a point beyond it, it, it can only have, you're going to have to help me with this, Paul. Um, you, you, what, what do you mean by influence? Like we, we talked about gravity, you're saying well, the Oort cloud wind, is, okay, so the Oort cloud is still bound gravitationally, which is an influence, right? Yes. But there's other things that mark those sort of zones? He's really young. <laughs> uh, it's a tough room. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, so the sun is emanating not just electromagnetic radiation that allows you and I to see, but it is also streaming off a lot of particles in the form of the solar wind. So there's a radiation pressure which is emanating all directions. But we're also moving through the interstellar medium. And so there is this bow shock which we're pushing in front of us because the interstellar medium itself is not as vacuous as, as you might think. And so like the Earth, as it moves around the sun, we push ahead of us uh, you know, the magnetic field, which gets compressed. That's our own magnetosphere, and that deflects the solar wind around us so you and I don't get fried. So there are events that are, or phenomena that are happening as a result of the motion of these objects. The sun, as a, a collective entity for the solar system, is pushing through the interstellar medium and it's protecting all of its local environment by the solar wind. And that creates this bow pressure at the front called the, solar, uh, the, the heliopause 
uh, and then once you get beyond that, beyond the heliosheath, you have got to the point where the sun is no longer the primary influence for the environment, but it's the interstellar medium that is influencing the local environment. Thank you. Ron? Um, did Voyager hit anything? In other words, how empty is space? You would think if it hit something that was of a, a mass that could cause the spacecraft to point in a slightly different direction, so suddenly they'd have to use the thrusters to put it back to a point where it's supposed to. Well, given the speeds that it's going, if it hit anything bigger than a dust grain, then it probably would have been a, a not a very good day. Um, I, it probably, I'm tr just trying to remember, I, I think there, was some, there were some hits as they went through the ring plane of Saturn, uh, but they would, that would be very, very fine fine material. There, that was the challenge to, you know, where to send it through the ring plane, uh, given how much they knew about the ring plane. And there were plans near the beginning. Someone said, well, let's put it through the Cassini division. And then they got there and looked at the Cassini division backlit, and it was full of stuff. So that would have been a, quite an, an exciting end of mission right there. But uh, you know, going 35, 40,000 miles an hour, yeah, you don't want to hit anything bigger than a, a dust grain. Hey, Randy. Um, you mentioned for Voyager 1 that it initially forfeited its trajectory to go by Titan. Was that correct? That's right. It couldn't go to Uranus and Neptune. Right. So besides like being the main moon in the solar system that has a significant atmosphere, what did they sort of expect to find on Titan? Well, they, they wanted to uh, determine uh, the, the composition of the atmosphere and the, and the temperature of the surface, if they could. Uh, and all of that led to the Cassini mission, where they actually took along a lander, and they, the, called Huygens, where they actually landed on the surface. So, uh, you know, there are thoughts that, the, that there are um, components, molecules on the surface of Titan that might be the organic molecules that, you know, that's potential life. And any time you find that in the solar system, you want to take a close look. Fascinating uh, place. Uh, just on his question, speaking of Titan, was it the Voyager that discovered the magnetic field that they were able to deduce the, the um, what was under the ice, I think, on, on Titan? Magnetic field on Titan? Anomaly. What's that? It might be Europa, yeah. The ocean on Europa? Yeah. I th yeah, I think, I think there might have been some theories, but yeah, it was definitely Galileo that uh, determined that. I'm going to bail you out at this point in time okay? because Ralph needs to conduct the lighter part of the, the meeting. And of course, you will be around at the end. So if you've got more questions, by all means, come down and corner Randy afterwards. But on behalf of the Toronto Centre, thank you very much for a fascinating... Thanks for your help. <laughs> Over to you, Ralph. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm sorry I was uh, a little bit late getting here, but uh, the traffic was uh, not kind. But anyway, I did make it, and I managed to listen to most of what Randy had to say, so that was great as well. Uh, it's hard to believe that you and I met about 47 years ago. Yeah, it's hard to believe it's been so long. And, uh, you know, even then, Randy had a very strong interest in uh, the space program, and uh, it's great to see that he's been able to carry it on uh, ever since. So, anyway, uh, thank you again for uh, coming out tonight and talking about Voyager. Well, let's take a look at some of the uh, upcoming events uh, for the Center. Our next meeting is on uh, January 24th. 
uh, two weeks tonight, and that'll be a recreational astronomy night. We do have a full program, which is nice, uh, starting with Andy Beaton uh, presenting the sky this month. Alex Stanmuir will uh, finally be able to do his presentation on space conspiracies, myths, and fake news. And then uh, Frank Dempsey is going to present on star lore and indigenous constellations over Turtle Island, which should be quite uh, fascinating. The next meeting after that will be a speaker's night. And as of the time that I'd prepared this uh, slide, I still hadn't heard from Paul as to whether we had a speaker. But I'm sure we will have one by the time I have this slide for the next meeting. Yeah. OK, so hopefully a special speaker, but otherwise then we'll go. OK, great. So again, that one will have the announcement on the uh, website, and uh, I'll have it for our, our next meeting as well. Uh, one of the things that I did want to point out was that uh, we do have council meetings occasionally to uh, look after the business of the center uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a corporate entity. Uh, our next meeting is actually uh, on Thursday, the 18th of January, and it's being hosted by Paul at York University uh, in the Petrie Building. And if you are interested in coming out to, uh, to uh, hear what we do and find out a little bit about how the center is run, uh, please feel free. Uh, just contact Tom Luton to let us know that you are coming so we uh, are ensured that we have enough room for you there. And we can also supply you with an agenda for the meeting. <clears throat> One of the things that's going to be discussed at that meeting is awards. And uh, at this time of the year, uh, organizations such as ours get to uh, put in for Ontario Volunteer Service Awards. And you can see these pins here, which are the 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and 50, 40 and 50 year pins. Uh, yes, they actually do recognize volunteers who have been active for 50 years. Uh, so in any case, uh, we are going to be looking for uh, uh, suggestions for this year's batch of uh, award uh, recipients. And if any of you does have any uh, suggestions about members of the center who uh, uh, we can consider for this award, please let us know. Uh, just email your suggestion to nominations at rasco.ca and uh, we'll take them under consideration. Uh, the only caveat is that the individual has to have been active for at least five years to qualify for the award and that would get them the five-year pin. And we do try to uh, uh, get a range of volunteers so that we may have one, uh, one or two recipients at the five-year level, but we also look at longer-term service as well. And in an organization uh, the size of ours, uh, there's got to be at least a few who uh, qualify for this award that we haven't already recognized. As far as our observing programs are concerned, here at the Science Center, we have the Solar Observing, which used to be uh, the first uh, weekend uh, Saturday of every month. What we are trying to do this year is a, a slightly different thing. We're actually uh, using, I think it's the full moon weekend to um, uh, 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 sort of uh, keep people from getting overextended by trying to do too many things uh, at a time. So uh, our first of these new dates for the solar observing is going to be the 27th of January. And in the usual way, Sean will do the go, no go call on either the Friday evening or the Saturday morning uh, of that weekend. And if it's cloudy or raining or otherwise inclement, uh, we'll shoot for the following week uh, as, a, as an alternative. But uh, again, we'll see how this works. Uh, and uh, if it's successful and uh, we can manage it, great. Otherwise, we can always go back to the old way after we see how this works for this year. However, our dark sky star parties and city star parties will continue to uh, go the way that we always have had those scheduled. And so uh, we'll have the first dark sky uh, star party, the first clear night of the week of January 15th. So again, uh, the host for that evening will 
uh, make the go or no go call each night and announce them over our usual uh, uh, facilities, Twitter, the website, Yahoo, and so on. And um, hopefully we will uh, get in some observing and hopefully it'll be on a clear light that isn't like the last two weeks. Uh, similarly, uh, the City Star parties at Baby Village Park, uh, first clear night this time around will be uh, 22nd to 25th of January. Special event on the 27th of January in the afternoon and evening, uh, a national star party that's being organized uh, and actually Paul Delaney has uh, got a very big role to play with this, but it'll be uh, uh, kicking off the celebrations of the RASC's 150th anniversary. And so from about three o'clock in the afternoon local time uh, for each of the centers uh, of the society coast to coast to coast, we will be uh, joining the party and at some point in the um, proceedings, each of the centers will have an opportunity to give a three minute online message, do something uh, for the public as well. And then about six o'clock or so Eastern time, I believe it is, uh, there will be a message from the national president um, as well. So all the details uh, will be, uh, oh, they are in scope, uh, the most recent issue. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, it just came out and uh, we will also have the details put onto the website as well. So again, it's a big uh, occasion, 150th anniversary. If you haven't already seen it, uh, this is the logo that um, uh, was designed for the uh, celebration and uh, there's all sorts of uh, stuff on the RASC uh, web store that you can get with this logo on it. Car Observatory, uh, the uh, uh, facility uh, is still available for use. Uh, even though the road is closed, you'll have to park on the top of the hill on uh, uh, the, um, what is it, the 18 side road, and then walk in. But uh, again, you can still book your uh, time there and go in. And hopefully, uh, you'll be able to get some clear observing there as well. Telescope Loan Program is uh, active, and we've got at least two of our managers there uh, in the uh, back row. And uh, if you're interested, please see George or Mark to um, find out about uh, what is available uh, for you to uh, borrow and try out. And finally, meeting after the meeting, uh, we do have, uh, uh, yes, I'll get to that in a moment, but we do have the slide up already. Meeting after the meeting is at the Granite Brew Pub uh, uh, once we leave here over at Mount Pleasant and Eglinton. And remember that the uh, intersection at Eglinton and Mount Pleasant, there's no turns, I think, still. So uh, there's other ways that you'll have to get there because the garage is accessed from Mount Pleasant uh, south of um, Eglinton Avenue. So just watch out for that. Finally, yes, we do have uh, still a few calendars left for 2018. Uh, still valid, still, still usable. So um, uh, they're, what, $20 a shot? Yeah. 11 left? 12. Okay. So uh, feel free. They are here. 20 bucks a shot. Okay. So I think that's everything for tonight. Uh, any other announcements that anybody has? Otherwise, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, it is warming up outside. When I got in, uh, the parking lot was clear of ice, so that's a good thing. So have a safe trip home. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night, everybody.